for the second debate between Republican Senator Ted Cruz and Democratic Representative Beto O'Rourke. In Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District, there's a three-way race between Democrat Susan Wilde, Republican Marty Nothstein, and Libertarian Tim Silfies. The candidates met last week in Allentown for a debate that focused on the economy, health care, and the recent confirmation of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. This is just under an hour. Business Matters starts now. Hey, hey, good evening, Business Matters. We are at beautiful, beautiful Credit Health. What a phenomenal crowd. This is a hugely important race. This could really tip the balance of power in this country. Really important. I want to thank you. Before I get started, I want to thank all three of you. Running for office in today's world is not for the faint of heart, and I thank you. You're good people. I want to, let's hear it for them for just stepping up and doing it. Loving it. All right. Why don't we start, we'll start with a little bit easy, we'll, we'll roll into this thing, and that is I want to start with, uh, I'll go a little bit economy, and uh, Marty, I know we did a flip of the coin, you're the first question. Minimum wage, we've talked, we know the governor here in Pennsylvania has talked about $7.50 to $15. Uh, and your thoughts on minimum wage, should it be raised, and what would the impact be from your perspective? Well, I don't necessarily think minimum wage should be raised uh, by, by the federal government. You know, we should let markets dictate what minimum wage should be, we really do. I don't like it specifically because it's going to hurt seniors. You know, anything that hurts seniors is something we need to take a serious look at. You know, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour is going to raise the cost of goods across the board. Who's that going to hurt most? Senior citizens on fixed um, income. So we've got to make sure we look at all aspects before we start making wholesale minimum, minimum wage uh, requirements. So uh, right now I can't support that. Again, I think markets should dictate what minimum wage should be. Gotcha. Susan, your thoughts I, on that? I'd like to rebut that. Um, we, are, we have a $7.25 an hour minimum wage, which if you're working 40 hours a week, puts you at about $15,000 and change well below, almost $10,000 below the federal poverty line. That is unconscionable. We have to start investing in our workers. And it's overlooked that the more money we put in the pockets of our workers, the stronger our economy will be because they will be able to buy more goods and to invest and to buy a house. All of the things that make our economy grow. I do think we need to do a phased in minimum wage. Okay, so, so not a jump right to, from not, seven not, to not an immediate jump because I, I am cognizant of the effect on on small businesses, but I absolutely think that we need a phased in minimum wage increase to $15 an hour. That's, that sounds good. And I think we all want the same things. We want workers to have good jobs and we want people to prosper. People can't buy goods and services if they don't have jobs. I saw this, I was the business reporter for this network. A lot of people might recognize me. And I saw this up close and personally when we were talking about raising the minimum wage, regular people, the entrepreneurs who drive this economy came to me and they said, Tim, I take care of my workers. I love my workers, but I can't afford this. I want to invest in my, in my company. I want to hire more people, and I can't when I'm forced to pay this much money. So we have to keep in mind the unintended consequences of this. So what are you saying? Uh, don't touch it. No, I, I, I think the market should de okay. determine it. And, and again, uh, Susie, do you think that leaves some people behind? Would you? I absolutely do. We have a federal min minimum wage of seven twenty-five an hour. Pennsylvania is one of the states that's elected not to go any higher than that. And I think that we are leaving a lot of people behind. So back to this market-driven economy. Right now we're talking about unemployment 3.7%. The market hit 26,000 the other day. Uh, the, the, the economy is good. Uh, hands off or what we could do differently? Uh, Susan, go ahead. The, the economy has been growing for a number of years preceding um, this administration. And the economy is great if you are able to invest in the stock market. But there are an awful lot of people here in the 7th District who don't have that ability. The people I talk to across the district don't feel like we have a strong economy because they're working, in many cases, two and three jobs to get by, to pay for their health care, to pay for their utilities. So the economy is working if you're already wealthy. So what you're saying is, uh, go ahead, uh, so you're saying leaving middle, uh, middle class poor behind or a combination of both? 
I'm sorry. I you say when in this economy we're leaving some behind. I think we are leaving working families behind and young people who are are trying to get out of debt from their from their education and mm -hmm. people who are underemployed. All right, Marty. The, the, go ahead, the, the go ahead Tim. I'm strong, go but we have to think about the underlying issues at hand. We have to have all of the aspects of a healthy economy. Keeping taxes and regulation low mm -hmm. is great. But we also need to think about balanced budgets and being fiscally responsible because those things are going to catch up with us. Both the Democrats and the Republicans for decades have been spending us into oblivion. And we now have $21 trillion in debt. We are have you, trillion dollar so deficits out to the horizon and both sides are to blame. That's why we need something different. Are you surprised by how little, like, how, go ahead. Uh, are you surprised by how little we hear relative to the debt? I mean, it really yes. is. Yes, it's is an imminent crisis. We okay, Marty, go ahead. Your yeah, turn. well, you know, we do have a buzzing economy right here in the Lehigh Valley. There's no doubt about that. You know, two years ago, we were told we would never see the GDP growth surpass 3% ever again. We were told our manufacturing jobs were long gone. And actually, I think we were told, you know, the only way they were coming back was by waving of a magic wand. We had an election. Two years ago, we had an election. And now we're seeing GDP growth sustainable at 4% this year. We have more jobs than people willing to work. So we have a budding economy right here in the Lehigh Valley. These are results. These are results we cannot argue. You know, we had the lowest unemployment rate since 1969. And in this election, a lot of it's going to be about the economy. And I've been campaigning hard. I've been every corner of this district. You know, I've been meeting a lot of people. You know, people are happy. People are jobs. Their families have jobs. Their kids have jobs. These are good things. All right, there we go. Hi. Right. I want to ask uh, this question. Maybe think uh, Charlie Dent, who of course had the seat uh, prior, was our congressperson before, who did a. I, I think. I guess my point is he broke rank with the president in, in, in some cases and uh, was maybe more independent uh, than most say uh, maybe people in that position were. The question I would ask any of you, because everyone talks today about bipartisanship, it sounds good, people get to Washington, the world changes. Uh, I'll start with you, Marty. Would you be, quote unquote, a rubber stamp for this president? Would you be more like a Charlie Dent who maybe took him on for affordable care, those kinds of things? Well, I'll never be a rubber stamp for anybody, Tony. You know, I'm an independent voice. You know, I have results at the county level as well, being that independent voice and working with both sides to get things done that matter most to our community. Well, that's creating the lowest millage rate for seniors and homeowners in 27 years, making big investments for our senior care center, uh, Cedar Brook. So to me, it's all about getting things done, viewing things in a pragmatic way and not stopping until you get it accomplished. You know, at times you have to work with both sides. I mean, that's what's going to make things move forward in this country. And right now, more than ever, that time is now. So we need to make sure we elect people who are willing to work with both sides and not be rubber stamps for any special interests or any special person. Tony. I'm not talk it's not about bipartisanship. It's about nonpartisanship. Are you happy with the partisan civil war in this country? Is this helping you and your family what's happening right now? If you want something different, you have to vote for something different. Because we can't continue down this road where both sides continue this partisan clash, this deepening <laughs> cultural conflict we have. We have to have actual independent voices who don't answer to a party or a president. Okay, Susan. I find it interesting that Mr. Nothstein says that he would not be a rubber stamp for the president. The, one of the highlights of his website is that he calls for the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, which of course Republicans have been trying to do forever now. Charlie Dent, to his credit, voted against the repeal of the ACA. And I, do admi I did admire that particular vote of his. I think he stood as an example of somebody who uh, was civil and dignified, not necessarily bipartisan, but I think that that's what voters are really looking for, is somebody who will go to Washington and behave in a civilized manner, be willing to work with people on the other side, and try to move this country forward. Because we just continually polarize from side to side, and that doesn't move us. Anybody want to jump back on that? Marty, you want to, you're, yeah. you're, you're good with that? Okay, so let's get back to that. So we're talking about bi bipartisanship and the need. Can you name something, Susan? Uh, I know it's on your site. It says you would, be, you would like to work in a bipartisan way. Can you think of something that might, where you might reach across the aisle uh, 
to work in conjunction with the Republicans? I sure can. Um, first and foremost would be infrastructure. I think infrastructure is something that is equally cared about by Democrats and Republicans and independents and everybody else. Um, it's something that would benefit this district tremendously. It would bring jobs. It would improve our infrastructure. We all saw the floods a few weeks ago when we had rain after rain after rain and drainage ditches were, were filling up. We desperately need infrastructure. It will bring good paying jobs and lots of them. That's the first thing I would like to try to work on with a, with somebody on the other in side. In a bipartisan way, okay. Absolutely. Marty. Absolutely. I, I, I would agree as well. Infrastructure is very important. I don't think there's a candidate up here that's not going to agree on infrastructure needs, especially right here in the Lehigh Valley. Education is also very important to us. You know, of education here in the Lehigh Valley is also very important. So I think, you know, bipartisan means to get these things accomplished is what's important. Is what's, it's going to take bipartisanship to get those accomplished. Great well. jobs and expand. I got it. Okay, the, Tim, your thoughts on that. So the difference between me and my opponents is that it's not just that I can cooperate with people I disagree with. I actually agree with both sides about different things. That's why I'm in a unique position to be sort of a neutral arbiter between these establishment parties because there are things I line up with Republicans about. There's things I line up with Democrats about. And it puts me in a really good spot to be able to be an independent voice for Congress. Does it put you in a really good spot when you get to Washington? I mean, it's great to say sure. it up here on the uh, up here on the stage. I'm an independent thinker. It is great. You got to go. Yeah, but you got to go to Washington and make something happen. And uh, let's face it, uh, parties are powerful. I don't believe I could be wrong. I don't think there's an ind there, I don't think there is an independent uh, Congress person right now. The other D's are ours. Uh, tell How's me that working that. for us. There we go, Bernie Sanders. Okay. But it's but that's the thing. It's who not, is a socialist not and not independent. But the anyway. House of Representatives. <laughs> Close. The House okay. of Representatives is supposed to be a place mm -hmm. where people go for two years, four years, and then they go home. That's why we should have term limits. That's why we should have people, regular people, regular people like us. Gotcha. What is so wrong with that? All right, go ahead. Anybody jump in? Yeah, I, I, speaking of term limits, you know, I'm the only kid that's taken a term limit pledge. You know, I put a personal term limit on myself. I've signed the term limit pledge as well. I will not take a government funding pension as well. Because I agree, you know, you're supposed to go down there and serve your people, serve your constituents, and then come back home, and then go and then work again. Susan, go ahead. If I just may say, bipartisanship is something that requires skill. It requires compromise and negotiation. These are skills that I have honed over 30 years as an attorney. My job has been to try to resolve disputes bet between people. I've had to work with a lot of very, very difficult people, and my job has been for my client to bring about a resolution that is a good one for them, but in order to do that, you have to have the other side feel like they were also able to get something out of it. So I think those are skills that are in essential in Washington. Okay, let's, very good, thank you. All right, let's jump so to one speak, that... You speak ahead. about what's been working in Washington. We have, we have a lot of attorneys and lawyers in Washington right now. Mm -hmm. it hasn't really been working, in my opinion. <laughs> Anybody want to jump on that? Or? I'll be happy to, to answer that. Um, there's, a, there's a reason there are a lot of attorneys in Washington, because Congress makes laws. And, <laughs> and I, think, I think the ability to understand... Um, how to read a statute, how to write a statute, how to make it strong and, and, and foolproof and, and without loopholes is something that really actually uh, where the legal training is essential and important. We're off to a good start with the bipartisan cooperation here. Oh, uh, well, all right, let me go, I'm going to go back to you then, Tim, when you say that. Uh, again, we've got two parties, have had two parties and for a long time, and, and the world has worked pretty well. What, do, what are you saying? I guess... I guess people, I want people to get to know, what are you saying in terms of a, an independent viewpoint? Uh, which, I mean, how does that translate into change, I guess is my point. For this district, in this moment in time, where we have this deep cultural strife, for this district to stand together with a common voice and say, the Democratic and Republican establishment is not working for us, and we want something different. For us to do that, that alone would send a message that would rattle Washington and would rattle that establishment that we're talking about. It's not working for us. It leaves all of us behind with total political dysfunction, endless wars, mountains of debt, while the two major parties enrich their own power and reward themselves and special interests. Okay, very good. 
All right, let's talk about something that is tough from a bipartisan standpoint, and that is the uh, most recent selection of Justice, now Justice Kavanaugh. Marty, would you have uh, voted for Justice Kavanaugh to be approved? Your thoughts on, where, on that whole procedure and where we are. Well, let's talk about the whole procedure. That was embarrassment. I mean, we as a nation are better than this. Uh, to make a circus out of uh, the appointment of our Supreme Court Justice, Judge Kavanaugh, was something that we should all be very embarrassed about. I think it was mishandled by both sides. I think to, to have Judge Kavanaugh's life put out there, as it was, was something that we should, you know, again, be embarrassed of as a nation. I think he's well fit. I think he's well suited for the Supreme Court. And would have voted for him. All right. Yes, I Susan, I... I, no I noticed my opponent makes reference to, do to Judge Kavanaugh having to put his life out there without mention of what Dr. Christine Blasey Ford did. Her, wor her worst fear was realized that she would go out on a limb and have to speak publicly and would be annihilated in the process. I read last night that she and her family still have not returned to their home because of death threats. Now, I think the entire process was overly politicized. I don't like the way it worked. I thought it was a perfect example of lack of civility and proper discourse in Washington. And I do think that the appointment of a Supreme Court justice should not be a highly politicized process. Tony, what happened no. with Merrick Garland was a highly politicized process, and it was continued here. All right, go ahead. What happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? Tony, the, Ka the Kavanaugh situation is a sad fiasco, and it's the embodiment of why the establishment parties are not working anymore. Because look at this. These two parties were willing to take two people's lives, Dr. Ford and Brett Kavanaugh, and rip them apart. Why? Because they wanted to win. Both sides just wanted to win. Is there any doubt in anyone's mind that if the roles were reversed, the exact same thing would happen? This is actually a great, it's a great endorsement for term limits on the Supreme Court because it's become so politicized that we need to... Dr. Ford's Marty. biggest fear was realized when the letter was leaked. She asked to remain anonymous. She did not want to be out in the public eye. It wasn't leaked by the Republicans. It was leaked by the Democrats. That's when her biggest fears were realized. And it's sad. It is sad. It's sad that we as a nation had to witness that. And I'm hoping moving forward that never happens again. Susan, if you were, if you were elected... If you're elected, you know, talk about partisanship, bipartisan, and there is, in fact, a push to impeach him as justice, would you be support that? I, I, no. I, I, at least not at this point in time, not based on what the, the record is. So your perspective process happened no, and you're going to live with it? I, or, yes. Yeah. I, I want to go to Washington to get things done. I don't, I'm really not interested in a two-year distraction process known as impeachment of anybody. Um, I think my whole reason for going to Congress is because I want to work for the people that are in this room and throughout the 7th District. I want to get things done. I don't want to see a bunch of circus sideshows. So you shows. don't revisit. Okay. All right. Good point. All right. Uh, let's keep rolling on this. And I want to talk a little bit about, well, let me, while I'm on this, real quickly, Marty, I, I know uh, uh, your campaign, you experienced uh, uh, an issue where, in fact, you were accused uh, of a uh, of workplace uh, a situation. Uh, your thoughts, I guess my question was, could you relate to the process having seen that and your feelings on what happened and, uh, and the effect on your campaign? Yeah, I think everybody knows how I feel about it or felt about it, falsely accused of something that never happened. You know, you're, you're, you, you have your whole uh, career in life exposed by an anonymous tipster. Uh, and it was devastating. It was devastating to me. It was devastating to my family. It was devastating to my campaign. You know, we got to we, we got to understand. In my situation, this is a tip that came 11 days after I announced my run for Congress. Do I think it's a political hit job? I sure do. Do I know where it came from? I don't. You know, but from day one, I said this never happened, and it never did happen, and the truth was on our side. Now, as we know, it's been cleared. Mm -hmm. It is. It is now in the past. But at the end of the day, damage was done. Yeah. So I could relate. I absolutely could relate to Brett Kavanaugh when he was there. Okay. Time. Thank you. Uh, you want to touch on it? Uh, yeah, do you want to say something? I'm sorry, like, Susan. I'd just like to say something about the media. I think we're all living too much in a world of the 24-hour news cycle, and it gets tiresome, and it becomes repetitive, and it does tend to inflame people in a way that perhaps isn't appropriate. But I do 
absolutely believe in the necessity for a free, independent press, that they, they have to show themselves to be responsible members of the press, but it's, it is a guarantee of the First Amendment of, to the Constitution, and it is one that is fundamental to our democracy. Yeah, all right. And so I guess back to the not for the faint of heart when you run today, you better, you better be uh, ready for that. So uh, a very good point. I want to also make sure we talk a little bit about immigration. And I, we have a two part to this, so we're going to have uh, more time. Uh, your thought, let, let's go right to, the, uh, to ICE uh, uh, and the, uh, the hit that they're taking in terms of uh, uh, both sides. Uh, anybody's thoughts? Uh, I'll, I'll go with you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Sophies. Your thoughts on, uh, uh, Tim, your thoughts on ICE and immigration where we are. Well, immigration where we are is total chaos because the establishment parties for decades have not solved this problem. And we don't have a semblance of an immigration system right now. And it's created chaos at the border and dysfunction. What I think we need is more legal immigration. We need more people coming here and we need them to do it legally. Okay. We need that for our economy, and I think more. So you're saying make it easier to legally immigrate? Is that yeah, what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Right, and what then about at ICE? the same time, it's fair to have border security and to have borders that are enforced. Where are you on ICE? Good, bad, just. I think the people are obsessed with ICE as an agency instead of looking at what these agencies do. And what what makes me uncomfortable, I don't think we need a force, an internal force going around the country. So you're for getting rid of ICE? No, like I said, the, the organization itself, it's, it's, it's what people call it that, um, that okay. matters. All right, Susan. Our, our immigration system is broken and has been for a number of years. That's exemplified by the uh, family separation policy, all of which we've seen the devastating effect of. I don't think the history books are going to treat us kindly for, for the separation of those families. Um, I think that as part of a comprehensive bipartisan approach to immigration reform, we have to take a hard look at ICE as well as other agencies and make sure that those agencies are doing the work that they were s called upon to do. And if that includes revising some of the things that they're called upon to do, then we, we create So you're not saying at this point, first of all, you're saying it's, it, you need to be, it's, it's broken, to, uh, the system, but I, ICE, you're, you're, not, you're not totally... I'm not, I'm not calling for the abolition of ICE. I'm calling for its reform as part of a comprehensive gotcha. okay, plan. Okay, good. Marty? Yeah, our immigration sy system is something we've been talking a lot about. You know, I don't necessarily think our immigration system is broken. We have laws in place right now. We're not enforcing the laws that we have in place right now. I mean, that's plain and simple. We are not enforcing our laws. We need to secure our borders, our port of entries. You know, we need, a f we need to fix our chain migration system as well. We want merit-based immigration in this country, not so much family-based. These are all things that are, that are on the books. We just need to enforce, enforce these things. As far as ICE goes, I think we need more ICE agents. Right now, we have roughly 3,000 ICE agents in the field right now. 1,500 of them are doing paperwork. The other 1,500 are securing our border. We right, need more so than that. So for ICE and, and not a how about, how about a simple question for the wall, yes or no? I, I'm opposed to the wall. I think it's a ridiculous waste of taxpayer money. I do believe we need secure borders. Okay. Tim. The wall, the wall is antiquated thinking of the old parties. I mean, I think we need technology. We need innovation and ways to secure the border that way. The wall is old thinking in my So more opinion. a technological wall yeah, instead sure. of a... A uh, physical. Yeah. Marty. The wall is one way to secure the border, you know, and we can use other avenues as well through technology and drones and more enforcement. So, but we do need to start securing our borders. Right, very good point. Good point. All right. Uh, almost getting close to the end of our first half. I do want to say this. I, I checked before I got here in terms of your, your campaigns and the fundraising. Uh, Susan, about 1.1 million. Uh, Marty, about a half. And uh, you're at... Um, I'm trying to think where we are, Tim. Uh, Thirty or sixty thousand? I'm sorry, sixty thousand. What is that? I guess my question is: uh, You have said uh, no dollars from corporate PACs, correct? That's correct. Uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, so I think the first priority that I, that all the new Congress needs to look at is campaign finance reform. It costs too much money to wage a campaign of this type, and that's money that could be well spent solving other problems in this country. I, I, won't, I don't and won't take corporate PAC money because I don't think that politicians should be answering to corporate sponsors. Um, as there was a joke about uh, 
politicians wearing NASCAR type jerseys with the, their corporations listed on, on their jersey. Um, I, th I think that's an inherent conflict of interest. Okay. Anybody else thoughts on where we are in fundraising? Tim, uh, your, uh, your thoughts? I mean, there's a disparity. Is that what's wrong with the system or is that not, or should you be getting more support? I think the answer to the question of financing in this race is to follow the money. Follow the money. Both of my candidates are very, uh, opponents are very well financed. And Susan says that she doesn't take money from corporations, but when you look at her funding, 35% of it comes from PACs and committees. So who, who gives money to those PACs? It's not a barber in Bath. It's not a baker in Hellertown. It's very rich people and okay. companies from all across the country who are trying to get their piece of the pie. Both of my opponents are establishment candidates. Okay, yeah. Susan, go ahead, then I'll go to Marty, please. Some of the PACs that have given to me are PACs like Planned Parenthood, to which people contribute at the rate of $25 a month on, an, on a regular ongoing basis. Um, League of Conservation Voters, similarly, small contributors who do it on an on, ongoing monthly basis. I've got more than 10,000 donors. Our average contribution is less than $100. So that's my response to Mr. Sulfies. All right, all right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Martin. I have a question. Yeah, you know, these elections cost incredible amount of money. And it's, and it's disgusting how much money is spent. And then we're talking about the money we raise. We're not talking about the outside money that's already here, that's already spending on, on, and on tech ads. Uh, you know, Susan raised a lot of money, and I agree with Tim, a lot of her money does come from PACs. It may not be corporate PACs, but it comes from PACs. So, you know, it's, it's a bit hypocritical when you say, I'm not going to take corporate PAC money, but I'll take special interest PAC money. You know, I, I received some PAC, I received some PAC money, business PAC money, it's just economy. I mean, again, if, if I will take money from, from business PACs that I believe in and I think are doing great things, not only for this country, but also for the Lehigh Valley here. So again, you talk about campaign finance reform, a lot of people are talking about this. If it was up to me, you know, I would say you're only allowed to raise the money within mm -hmm. your district. Because if you look at it and you look at the money and you follow the money, you will see there's a lot of money coming from outside this district. To make, right. to, We're to, almost out of time. Do you want to touch on that? Is there a difference between a corporate PAC and yes, Emily's list? Yes, there absolutely is. The PACs that I take money from are value-based PACs, either people who care about the environment, people who care about reproductive choice, people who care about education, people who care about working people like labor unions. My opponent has taken money from insurance companies, the NRA. That's a corporate PAC. Okay. All right. I, listen, I want to say this. Plus, we have a million more questions. I want to get back to this. We are out of time for our first half. So thank you for being with us. Thank you, everybody. We will be back next week for the second half. Business Matters. Thank you so much. Hey, hey, good evening, everyone. Again, back here at Coordinated Health. Hugely, hugely important race. Could shift the power of this nation. Again, as I said in the first half, and I know we've done a lot of clapping, but again, to all three of you, not for the faint of heart to run for office today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tim Silfies, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll say this. We used to have that much energy until we started running for Congress, <laughs> I promise you. To Lisa on the seat, yeah, I'll tell you that yeah, much. That's true. Tim Silfies, I want to start with you in the second half. Second Amendment, guns, your thoughts on where we are where, and your stance on that. I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I think, but look, my, I come at this, I'm not a member of the NRA. I'm not a hunter. I come at things from a philosophical perspective. Yes. And for me, I, th I believe in protecting all of our constitutional rights um, across the board. And part of that is the Second Amendment. Yeah. People have a right, a natural right, to protect themselves and their families and their property. And this is something enshrined in the Constitution for a reason. All right, very good. Tim, do you think, I know you and I agree on this, do you think someone with hair can make a good, good <laughs> congressperson? We're going to find out soon enough, Tony. <laughs> anyway, all right, Second Amendment. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't resist that. Susan, you want to jump in on Second Amendment? We'll go to Marty. I'm a big believer in the entire United States Constitution. I don't think any of it should be infringed. I don't think any of the rights under the Constitution should be taken away. Um, I am not interested in taking away anybody's guns. I do believe in the right to self-defense and, and sporting um, and hunting. Uh, some of my family members own guns. I do, however, believe that just as other parts of the 
Constitution have been interpreted with reasonable limitations. For instance, the First Amendment, you can't go into a crowded theater and yell fire, um, even though you have an absolute right to free speech. So it's the same kind of thing with the Second Amendment. My only feeling about the Second Amendment is that we must do something to curb gun violence. We have to do, in, enter into uni universal background checks. 95% of the people in this country believe that universal back che background checks are in order. So the only people who oppose it most likely are those who are interested in committing crimes. I think that we, if we don't do something, we risk a world where our children cannot feel safe to go to school. Marty. Yes, um, you know, I, I fully support the Second Amendment. I agree with, with Tim and, and Susan. You know, it's an important part of our Constitution. I am a hunter and a shooter. Uh, it's an important uh, part of my life. Spending time in the, in the great outdoors with my family is something that I truly cherish and, and love. I think everybody has a right to protect themselves. Uh, I think Susan is downplaying her support of guns. I have an A rating from the NRA. She has an F rating from the NRA. You know, they just don't hand these things out, you know, uh, by action. So, I, I do support the Second Amendment. It's an important part of our Constitution. Everybody has a right to defend themselves. All right. Susan, you want to jump on that? Or? I was unaware that the NRA had given me a rating at all, and I don't know why they would since I have no record on it. But I guess it's because I'm not willing to take their money. Let's go back to health care. Again, affordable care. We talk, I get to talk to business people. I, I happen to see there's a business person in this audience that I know is paying over $2,000 a month uh, to, for to cover he and his, his spouse. Uh, affordable care, uh, some say not affordable and is broken and needs to be fixed or done away with completely. Your thoughts, I'll start with you, Marty. Your thoughts on Affordable Care Act, health care, and where we should go. Well, it's definitely not affordable anymore. We know that. Uh, my family's one of them. We pay a lot of money. Our, you know, health care is now more than most people's mortgages. You know, four years ago, uh, or, or health care's increased 123% over the last four years. This is something that needs to stop. You know, we, we are now seeing our health care being the number one driver of household uh, income bills. And this is something that we have to take a serious look at. I believe we should open up uh, uh, the industry across state lines, bring in competition, keep the government out of it, definitely keep the government out of it, and, and, and open up the competition, find out what the real cost of health care is, and try to find ways that we can create lower costs for health care. Quality health care. Would you vote to abolish affordable care? Or change well affordable care is now the rule the law of the land you okay. know and I think you know dismantling it piece by piece is something that's possible we've we've taken away the individual mandate which is a good first step but I don't think we're ever going to get rid of it I okay. really don't Susan your thoughts on our health care system much like our immigration system is broken um, we one of the reasons it's so unaffordable is because we allow insurance companies to dictate our our health care and how much will be paid for it um, it, it, it has become unaffordable, and we have to turn the Affordable Care Act. We have to go back and look at what its original purpose was and make it affordable. We have to, uh, we have to offer a wider array of options. But we absolutely cannot get away from protecting people with pre-existing conditions. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, I talk to people throughout this area with diabetes and cancer and heart disease who are scared to death the coverage for their pre-existing conditions Tony, is going that, to be taken a, yeah, away. Ab absolutely, I agree with that. You know, we have to make sure we, we cover pre-existing conditions. We also, I, I like the fact that we can keep children, I shouldn't say children, young adults up to the age of 26 on their families' health care plans. Those are smart things to do. Tony, those are things that need to be protected as well. The, the, the establishment parties have centralized control of health care more and more and more in Washington, both of them, for decades. And what has happened? Prices have gone up and up and up, as we're talking about. And people, regular people I talk to all the time, have become more and more concerned about the quality of their care. What we need to do, we, we, there's actually too much agreement happening between them in some ways, because we need to stop centralizing control of health care in Washington and diffuse it out more to the states and, and put innovative private sector solutions into it. Susan talked about insurance companies. One thing that isn't covered by insurance is LASIK eye surgery. And what's happened with LASIK eye surgery? Quality's gone up, prices have gone down. We need more things like that. So your market, hands off market, let the market, uh, make the market do it. That's what I like, but I also like, let the states do it. Let yeah. the states do different things. They can be laboratories of innovation that then people can, 
choose what they like. All right, so we saw most recently now Nikki Haley uh, resigning uh, her position. And I, I guess my point I want to ask you, and that is this, that every day uh, there is a news story. So you can have to say that I guess this president's been great from, for the news media. That's for sure something coming along every single day. But uh, you had made the point a little bit earlier, Susan, that with the amount of information out there today, 24-hour news, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a continuous battle. So the question I have is, is it just democracy at work, or are we at a dysfunctional point? Anybody's thoughts on that? Are you talking about with regard to the media? Or? Yeah, and just general, what we I, see. We, with the, again, what they do the hearings most I, recently. I'm worrying about dysfunction in Washington, particularly. I don't know that we're dysfunctional at a local and community level, but I think Washington has stopped working for the people that it is supposed to represent. I am concerned by the turmoil in the administration and by the... A, a record number of departures of key players in, in the administration, and that I think does not provide stability that we need going forward. So the flip side that would be safe to you, Marty, and that is the economy is running solid. We've got uh, maybe something going with North Korea that we were afraid we're going to be at war at. Your thoughts is is are we on uh, are we on a, in a good place? And would you want to continue this particular course that we're on? Well, I think our economy is definitely in a good place. There's no doubt about that. I mean, the numbers don't lie. But I do believe, with, I do believe uh, what Susan said. You know, there's some partisan anger and gridlock right now in Washington, D.C. And that needs to stop, you know, because eventually nothing's going to get done. You know, and, and the fact that you have both sides right now would rather see each other lose and have the American people win. Again, we are better than that as Americans. But the partisan anger, the partisan gridlock, no matter what it is, is something that's taken over every news cycle right now. And right now is the best time to elect new leaders, a new generation of leadership, new leaders who will go down there and try to get things accomplished. I'm the only candidate up here with a record of results getting things done at a county level. I expect to do the same thing in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Tim. The, the tribal civil war happening is ripping us apart. It is. And we agree about that. The difference is, I'm the only candidate who isn't a part of either one of those machines. And they, the, the parties deliberately drive the divisiveness. They want these web issues. They want us to fight with each other. And the only way we can get past that is if we vote for something different. OK. Very good. Anybody want to touch that one? All right, we move on. All right, let's talk about this. We were talking a little bit about, uh, about uh, we talked about the economy. I want to, well, something that's really important, we got a lot of millennials. We got them in the audience, we got them working for us. College cost is, is really tough on younger people. And in fact, in some ways, stealing the American dream. Anybody's thoughts on what we might do? Some people say this could be the next mortgage crisis. Any thoughts on the fact that people are uh, handling hundreds of thousand dollars? Well, I don't want to get too crazy, at least in the high numbers of thousands of dollars for college costs. Your thoughts on that and what you might do about it, Susan? Tony, as somebody who put myself through college and law school, um, the cost of student loans now and, the co and a college education, but not just a college education, higher education for those who don't want to go to college, vocational training, apprenticeships, it's all too high. We are turning our younger generation into a generation of debtors who are never going to be out of debt. They're never going to be able to produce and, and consume the way our economy depends on. So they graduate now from whatever program, often with a, what looks like a mortgage on a suburban house or something, and instead of being able to actually go out and buy a house and build a family and raise their kids and buy the consumer goods that we all depend on, we must do something about it, and I think it's time for us to put that generation first. So would you put, would you, would, are you for a program that would help uh, fund or dissipate some of those, uh, those uh, in other words, dollars for people who have debt? Well, I think we have to do two things. I think we have to bring down the cost of debt for new students mm -hmm. and, and people entering. And I think we need to work on restructuring debt for those who have it. I think it's, I think it's a crime that the interest rates on private student loans exceed what my car loan interest rate okay. is or my mortgage right. rate. Marty. I, I, I agree. Re restructuring debt is something that needs to happen. Uh, you know, taking on an incredible debt load after graduating, expecting to have a, a, a job in the workforce and it's not there for you is something that a lot of students face. Uh, several years ago, there were a lot of people who, who graduated from universities without jobs and, 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 and with a high, high level degree. Right now, that's not the case. 
there are more jobs and there are people willing to work. You know, one thing that I will say is we also have to encourage kids to now look at trades, skilled labor jobs. We need welders, we need plumbers, we need electricians. Not everybody has to go to a four-year college, risk taking on that debt and not having a job waiting for them. But restructuring debt is something that needs to be taken a look at. Tim, anything on that one? That part is exactly right about skilled workers. I mm -hmm. saw this all the time when I was the business reporter for this network. The, there are jobs sitting there that are great jobs that need to be filled. I don't know why politicians are always insisting that everyone needs to go to college. And one of the results of that is the prices going up and up and up. Why does that happen? One of the reasons is because the government continues to give out loans, mm -hmm. more and more and more loans, and what happens? Colleges know they can keep charging more and more and more, and it's why we're in this ridiculous situation where politicians are telling everyone they have to go to college, and kids are choosing between, do I wanna to go to the school with the rock climbing wall, or do I wanna to go to the one with the spa that's $50,000 to put me in debt, and the students are the ones that end up with the problem, Go ahead, jump a lot, in, anybody. A lot, of, a, a, lot of this, a lot of this debt does come from private universities as well. They have great marketing strategies. They encourage uh, individuals to, to, to participate in college who normally shouldn't be uh, taking college courses. Mm -hmm. they, they, they acquire an incredible amount of debt, uh, and then they have to pay it back without even a degree. So that's another thing we need to look at are private universities and these, and these catchy marketing plans. Susan. This is not just about people who decide to go to fancy universities with climbing walls and spas. This is about people who want to advance themselves and want to find some sort of vocation or career. One of the reasons I'm so happy to be endorsed by the AFL-CIO and other labor unions is because they provide exactly the kind of apprenticeship and training programs that a lot of people in this district need. And the Republican attacks on organized labor, I think, are one of the worst things that is happening in the country today. All right, we're gonna, I wanna, I wanna make sure we get across, I wanna make sure we get across the sea and talk about foreign policy. You're gonna have to be elected, have to participate in foreign policy. Uh, I'll just start at 30,000 feet. Do you like the direction of our foreign policy, uh, taking on some, uh, some other countries, China and so on, relative to tariffs, as well as pointing out uh, the issues with Iran? Your thoughts and general thoughts on foreign policy? I'll start with Susan, and we'll go right down the line. I think it's a mixed bag right now. I think that there is um, some good that the Trump administration is trying to accomplish in the field of trade and tariffs. Um, but on the other hand, I think that there is no sound strategy or long-term thoughtful thinking um, that's going on. And that, that concerns me greatly. We ha should not have a president who is meeting with the leader of a country that is known to have hacked our democracy in, the to to in 2016 and beyond. I think that's inappropriate. I think efforts to, and I also am very, very concerned about how, if, how the relationship we have with our longtime ally allies that we've had for decades now that are essentially being shredded. And we need those allies. They need us, and we need them. And I'm very, very concerned about that. You're being Europe. You're concerned, for instance, with for, ins for instance. OK. Marty. Yeah, I, I like the way our president's been handling everything. I really do. I, I feel like he's brought, he's brought some leaders to, to negotiating tables we never thought would be possible. Uh, this is a man who comes with business experience. He's all about the negotiation. We're seeing that. We are seeing that right now. Hey, say what say say what you want, but you know he is the first leader to sit down with North Korea. He has he he has he has China coming to the to the negotiating table with his trade and tariffs. Uh, he has terrorists on the run. These are good things. These are th good things that happen. So, all right, Tim, Tony, it's interesting the way you framed the question. That was as members of Congress, you're going to have to deal with foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is, I wish Congress would more, because this is a huge problem and one of the reasons I'm running, because do-nothing Congresses for decades have abdicated power back to the executive branch on a lot of these things that you're talking about. The Congress is supposed to have war-making power in this country, not the president. Congress is supposed to oversee trade policy instead of letting a president just launch a trade war. These are things, I, wanna, I want Congress to go back to having more power and more decision-making uh, 
at the table with, with things like this. You, you mean more power or be more de de definitive in terms of what they're doing, make decisions and act? Is that what you mean? Or? Both. I think that they should act as a check on the presidency and not just pick the president that they like. And I also think that the, I think that the, the Congress's intended role was for that. Gotcha. Okay, uh, talk about, real quickly if we can, uh, make sure we get all the items in, uh, legalization of marijuana. We've got medical marijuana in many states. Uh, it has had an impact, uh, let's face it, the situation has had an impact on our prisons. Uh, your thoughts on legalization of marijuana, and I'll start with you, Tim, and come down the other direction. Uh, yes, I think we should legalize marijuana, and more broadly, I think that we should, we should end the war on drugs. Um, I have seen this, this affected me Personally, in my life, one of my best friends, like a brother to me, died of a heroin overdose. Um, and I know this is something that's touched a lot of people around this district. I'm sure Marty and Susan have heard it too, in their ways around, around this district. I mean, I think we have to accept the fact that addiction is a health issue, and it's not a crime. And throwing people in jail for that has done nothing but create disastrous unintended consequences. So you don't see marijuana as an entree to, to any other drugs or addiction? I don't know about that. What okay. I know is that the- I'm not saying you What do I know don't. is that the prohibition of it doesn't do anything. Gotcha, okay, very good point. All right, Marty. Yeah, I, I'm fully supportive of medical marijuana. Uh, right now, I cannot support legalizing marijuana for recreational use. Okay. You know, just it's, it's who I am morally. It's, it's, it doesn't uh, sit well with me. So, but uh, legalizing it uh, is something right now I just cannot support. Are your concerns uh, maybe the, similar to alcohol, the ac uh, accidents, uh, impaired driving? I mean, your your position on that is based on all of the above. Okay. Yeah. All all right, above, right. What you just Susan. I am in favor of legalizing marijuana, but with all of the same attendant laws that we have concerning alcohol, so that so that. If you're driving while impaired, whether it's alcohol or it's marijuana, you are subject to penalties. Um, I think that we must expand the use of medical marijuana. I think it's in Pennsylvania, we have medical marijuana allowed, and yet they can't use it in the veterans' hospitals because we have, don't have a marijuana law at the federal level uh, that would allow, allow them to use them in the, um, in the veterans' hospitals. And finally, I think it's a source of revenue. Honestly, there are so many people using marijuana who are not, um, who are going to continue to use it, and our municipalities can actually derive income from that. All right, very good. All right, let's, let me get to this one. Let, let me just ask you this so people get to know you. We've had Brown Range. What would be the first one, maybe two things? I'll start with you, Marty, then go over to Tim, and then to you, Susan. First thing, one or two you'd work on the minute you got to Washington. National, national debt. I mean, we do have incredible spending problem in this country. We do. We need to, we need to rein in our national debt, make sure that we get back to, to balanced budgets, creating budgets, something that hasn't been done in years. Uh, right now, we're a country that just spends like mad, you know, a lot more than we're taking in. That's something that needs to stop, or else we're going to hand it off to our great-grandchildren, and it's unfair. Would you be willing to make what are tough decisions to cut that spending? I mean, let's, it, we really, we almost hear nothing about the, 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 uh, the deficit at this point. It's about program. Well, when, when we're continuing with uh, continued resolutions and, 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 and creating uh, spending bills with, with CRs, I mean, mm -hmm. this is something that, you know, they're kicking the can down the road, so tough decisions need to be made. I've done it at a county level. I expect to do it at a federal level as well. All right, so that's your first this thing. Tim, now go to Susan. This is what we hear from Republicans all the time, that we need to cut the deficit, and then what happens? <laughs> they cut the deficit, or I mean they cut taxes and ran up deficits worse in a lot of times than the Obama years. This is what we hear from Republicans running, and then Republicans who win, spend away. So that's, that's why we need something different from right. the two parties. Go ahead, jump in, then I'll go to Susan. Go ahead. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll just say this. You know, because of our federal, uh, our, our, our new federal tax act, you know, we have seen a surplus right here in Pennsylvania. I mean, these are corporate receipts that we're seeing. So right now, the state of Pennsylvania it has a $200 million surplus because of corporate tax receipts. That's because of the federal tax cut that we've seen. The tax so, cut's so, great. We just have to also cut spending. All right, Susan. The recent tax bill added $3 trillion to our national debt and... That is going to be made up by Republicans on the backs of working people by taking away Medicare and Social Security. But to answer your question, Tony, my first priority in Congress would be campaign finance reform 
followed closely by health care reform and um, infrastructure. Okay. Well, Tony, when you I, say Tony, I like I like to say this, you know, again, uh, the Republicans are going to are going to pay for the tax cuts by taking money out of Medicare. Democrats forget to tell everybody how they took 762 million dollars out of Medicare for Obamacare. You know, that wasn't too long ago as well. So, again, there's both sides to blame here. It's not one side or the other. Exactly. All right. Did you want to comment on that, Susan? Not on that, but I just wanted to say it, uh, regarding campaign finance reform. Yeah, I wanted to ask you that why is that yeah, your number like, one priority? It's my number one priority because it affects every single issue that Congress votes on. Um, and we have too much big money, dark money in politics. I've been endorsed by End Citizens United, and I'm very proud of that fact. I think we absolutely have to get to some sort of campaign finance funding uh, policy that lowers the amount of total money in politics and restructures the way we, we fund our campaigns. Anyone want to jump on that or good with that? I, okay. would, I, would, I would like to know exactly how she's, she plans to do that. I mean, what are your specifics? I think it's a great idea. There are a number of very good uh, bills pending right now in um, Congress that haven't made, gotten any traction because they've been opposed by Republicans. John Sarbanes out of Maryland has a terrific one called, I think it's called We the People, but I'm not, don't quote me on that. And it has to do with limiting the amount. And if, if uh, candidates agree to cap their donations at a certain level, they're entitled to matching funds for it. When it comes to campaign finance, follow the money. Both of these, both of my opponents are corporate establishment candidates. This district is awash in money from everywhere. Isn't that the way the system works, I guess, is the question. Uh, is, is that if it's words, the way it works then just but just be honest about it that's that's the difference okay all right very good all right so listen here's what we need to do uh, I the this particularly the host in particular failed to do the opening <laughs> opening uh, argument so I want to do this we want to give you more than enough time so we're gonna add another uh, 25 seconds to your closing statements so you have enough time before we do that I want to say to everybody thank you all you've been a great great audience you have been fantastic thank you thank you so, as I recall, Michelle said, it'll be Tim, Marty, Susan. So, Tim, uh, you got about 20 more seconds than you, I said I did 25, I just knocked five off of it. But hey, about 20 more seconds than you would have had originally. Give you a little more time for your closing statement. Kill it. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everyone. Is the partisan civil war in this country helping you and your family? That's the main question of this entire election. And if you want something different, you have to vote for something different. We've seen this playing out for decades of the carousel going round and round and round of both establishment parties enriching themselves and their special interests and leaving all of us behind with mountains of debt, endless war, and broken dysfunctional government. The only way left, the only way left for us to stop this deepening cultural and political divide we have is to have the courage to stand together and say, this system is broken and we need something different. There you go. Tim Selfies. All right, Marty. Thank you, Tony. I mean, what a great conversation this was. I'd like to just say this. I mean, what a difference two years makes. Two years ago, we were told we would never see GDP growth reached 3% ever again. We were told our manufacturing jobs were long gone. We were facing the highest corporate and small business income tax in the entire world. We had unemployment levels that were unacceptable. Then we had an election. Look at where we are now. We're going to have sustained 4% GDP growth. We have tax reform that has put more money in the pockets of hardworking families. We have more jobs than there are people willing to work. Our unemployment level is at historic lows, the lowest since 1969. This election is going to come down to a simple choice. It's going to be results or resistance. If you want to continue with the results and what we've seen over the last two years, I think we know who you should vote for. Embrace the results. Or on the other side, prepare for resistance. If you make the wrong decision, and our economy will be headed downwards. This election is going to be about the economy, it's going to be about our people, it's going to be about what's, what matters most to the United States, and most importantly, what matters most to the people of Lehigh Valley. Okay, Martin Austin. 
Susan Wilde, close us out. Thank you so much, Tony, for hosting this important event. I grew up in a military family that lived paycheck to paycheck. I put myself through college, and when I got to law school, I was really struggling, and, I, and what saved me were federal student loans. Now, 30 years later, I've been practicing law here for all this time. My two children were born here, raised here, and went to public schools here. And by the way, I paid back those student loans. That's the way government is supposed to work, in my view. We have to invest in our future people in this country. I believe in equal opportunity for everyone. I think that we, I want to go to Washington so that I can work to accomplish affordable, high quality health care for every single person so that, I can, so that I can work on raising wages for the working families right here in the seventh district so that we can protect our seniors and our students. I'm not a politician. I don't take corporate PAC money. If I'm elected, I will answer only to you, the voters of the 7th District. That's what I want to do. We can change how Washington is working, but we can only do that by changing the people that we send to Washington. All right. Hey, I want, I want to thank all of you. What a great crowd. I want to thank these three candidates. I want to thank you out there. I want to thank our friends at Coordinated Health. Hey, don't forget, if it's business, it matters. We'll see you all next week. With 21 days until the election, there's more debate coverage tomorrow on C-SPAN, starting at 7 p.m.